Good morning. It's good to be with you this Father's Day during this uh, time. It's also good to have had my daughter do the call to worship. It's very rewarding to see that as a father. And my spiritual daughter, Vicki, uh, here in her home. It's one of the things that I believe about being a father is that all men in the church are in some way a father to the children in the church, that our responsibility as parents, as mothers and fathers in the church, is to raise up children in the Lord, and we do that by our example and our teaching. And so everyone, every man in the church is a father, and I believe scripture bears that out, and every woman is a mother. As we turn to our scripture lesson, which is primarily from James, let's bow our heads and hearts in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to you for giving us this opportunity to worship together. We pray for those who are ill. We ask for your guidance and direction in how we can help. We pray for those who are involved in protests and pray for them to be peaceful and to represent you in what they're trying to achieve. We pray for our congregation, Lord, as we are separated, that you continue to bring us together in every way possible so that when we return, we will have those strong relationships even stronger than before. We ask these things and we pray these things. On this Father's Day, we pray for fathers all over the world, and we ask that you be with them, help them to enjoy this day. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I could stand here and say that I am directly responsible for my child's being an elder in the church and for Vicki preaching, but that would be hubris. Hubris. It's the title of our sermon this morning, and it is a Greek word, an ancient Greek word, that describes a personality quality of extreme or foolish pride, dangerous overconfidence, often in combination with or synonymous with arrogance. Julius Caesar famously said, it's only hubris if I fail. And that's not true. It's hubris regardless if you succeed or fail. But when you do fail, it's rather evident, like when you announce massive crowds that don't show up. Or perhaps maintain an economy and control it, that you yourself have done that alone, or that you have done more for people about racism than any president since Abraham Lincoln. And then there's COVID-19, and then the sin of racism leads to confrontation and protest, and an economy that the president supposedly controlled, goes down the drain. The crowds who show up at his rally have dissipated, and those who attend risk their health. And at the same time, protests 
of the sin of racism continue to grow and spread. From a human perspective, perhaps it's hubris if you fail. But from God's perspective, it's hubris regardless of whether you succeed or fail. To claim that you have control of anything. Isaiah 2.17, which was read this morning, reminds us that the arrogance of man will be brought low and human pride humbled. The Lord alone will be exalted on that day. The Lord alone is in control. The Lord and alone deserves the praise and the credit for any good that's done by human hands. And the Lord alone will be exalted. Hubris. The Apostle Paul uses the form of a word to define the arrogance of those in charge of the ship that was shipwrecked that he was on. Because he told them what God was going to do. He told them the words of the Lord and they refused to listen. They knew better. Thus the ship was wrecked. Jesus in his parable of the tenants, he tells the parable of the tenants where the landowner rented out the property and then sent men to collect what was due him and they were mistreated, they were killed. And so he sent his own son. And Jesus uses the form of the word hubris to describe their attitude and their way of doing things that they would actually decide in their arrogance that the best thing they could do was to kill the son. And this parable is about Jesus. And so when we turn to his life and his example, we see that the crucifixion is actually an act of hubris. That God would send his son into the world to save the world and people would crucify him. Jesus is actually saying this about all of us because we are the ones with our sins who required the crucifixion of Jesus for our salvation. It would even be hubris to say that I am a wonderful father. And because of being a wonderful father, my children turned out so well. In reality, we have no control of the outcome, none of our children. We have seen good fathers can have evil children and evil fathers can have good and godly children. We have no control. We really have no control as to whether or not we'll see the end of this day. If COVID-19 has shown us anything, we have no control. Or that I will finish this sermon. This is what James is telling us in our New Testament scripture. In James 4.13, Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go do this and that to this or that city and spend a year there, carry on business and make money. 
He says, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. The reality is that we should give credit to whom credit is due. Only God knows and only God has control. That's why as a father, it is so important to pray for our children because that is our direct communication with God who knows and God who has control. And so James says that instead, in verse 15, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. If it is the Lord's will. I will finish this sermon. If it is the Lord's will, our children will grow up in the Lord. If it's the Lord's will, I will make this or that promise. As a young father, when I read this scripture, I realized, I began to realize the truth that it is important not to make a lot of promises to your children, and especially not to make promises that you don't intend to keep. But even if you do intend to keep them, you're not in control. Something may happen. And children do not do well with broken promises. So one of the things that I would say as a father whenever my children would ask me if I would do something for them is I will try or I will think about it. I should have said if it's the Lord's will. That would have been the appropriate thing to say. And for those of you who are young fathers today, I would encourage you to do that. If it's the Lord's will, I'll take you to Cedar Point. If it's the Lord's will, I'll do this or that or the other. But I used the other terms and I made sure that I didn't make a lot of promises and I actually did that as a pastor too so that when people would come to me and say, you promised me this, I, I could very easily say, no, I didn't promise you. I said I would try or I said this or I said that. And remember that I purposely did not promise. But in one way or another, even these things, so, which is why you should say it's the Lord, if it's the Lord's will, don't turn out so well. My middle child at some point when I told him I'll think about it, looked at me and, sa and really sad and I said, what's wrong? And he said, when you say that, that means no. He had already decided that when I say I'll think about it, it means no. Well, the reality is that the things that children ask you, most of them, you should be answering no. And if you think about it, you do. But they ask you in a moment of weakness and you go forward and make promises that you may not actually keep. James goes on. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. Such boasting like what a good father I have been. The truth is, the truth is that I have at times been a good father and I have at times failed. I need Jesus. I need Jesus because everything that I have done that's been good has been him. When we see as, when we as fathers 
display love and tenderness and bring up our children in the Lord and do those things that are of God. We are displaying Jesus. That's Jesus working through us. And so I need Jesus to be the kind of father that I really want to be. And I need Jesus when I fail. I need Jesus. When we look after and nurture and protect and listen and encourage and we do so much good for our children, we do the good we ought to do because Jesus showed us and taught us it is right and of God. We do the good we ought to do regardless of the outcome for only God is in control. We do the good we ought to do to help our earthly relationships with our children. We do it because of Jesus. But what is even more important is our relationship with God. Where I fail, I also need Jesus. I need forgiveness. James 4.17 tells us, If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. And the truth is, as a father, I have sinned. I believe that as a parent, each and every one of us has sinned. We all need forgiveness. It would be helpful to our human relationships if those we sinned against would forgive us, but we have no control over that. And for this, we need to continually pray that they will at some point Come to know Jesus in the way that we do and forgive. But what is essential is our relationship with God. And God, our Heavenly Father, out of love for us, sent us Jesus. And Jesus, out of love for us, accepted the punishment that we deserve for the sins that we've committed, the things we ought to do and the things we ought not to do. He died for them all, suffered and died on the cross as punishment for our sins. So that when we turn to him and when we seek forgiveness, we turn to him as Savior, Jesus, my Savior, my Lord. We are forgiven. Forgiven. That's so powerful. We can go from that forgiveness to forgive those who have sinned against us. Even our children, because sometimes that happens too. We can do this through Jesus. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for those times in our lives when we have done the things we ought to do because you have shown us, you have taught us. We are so grateful to be able to do those things that are holy and righteous, that help others, that demonstrate your love to the world around us, especially to our children. And we thank you, Lord, and we praise you because you're the one in control. You're the one that deserves the credit. And then we turn, Lord, and we also pray for your forgiveness. For those fathers who are hurting this morning, Lord, we ask that you show them your love and let them know that through Jesus they are forgiven. Guide and direct them. Help them. 
For when we are forgiven, we can go forward and into our future, demonstrating your love and doing the things we ought to do. And we ask, Lord, for that wisdom. We pray, Lord, for that humility. We ask, Lord, for your forgiveness for the sin of hubris. All these things we pray and ask that you might be represented in the world through us and that the world would come to know you and be blessed through you, through Jesus. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. My name is Vicki Pruitt Sorrell, and I'm the pastor here at Lehigh Community Church. And I want to thank you for viewing our worship service. Here at Lehigh Community Church, we are a community of believers called to carry the message of God's peace throughout the world and in our community. All people are invited to join us on Sundays at 11 o'clock for our spirit filled worship service. If you're unable to make it to church on Sunday, Please consider liking, sharing, or subscribing to our channel. And don't forget to ring the notification bell.